All right, I'm going to share my screen. Um, I spent the whole like three or four hours trying to understand how to assess the data. But just put it next to the stuff. I just you know, nice. You know, Shamsuddin, I got into this book because Jared Lander, the one who runs the New York Statistical Group um, thing, you know, the meetup page. He talks about how anytime he gets a new data set, he doesn't put it in our studio or anything. He says, I first go to the command line based on skills that I've learned from Jaron, I mean, the author, and I actually mess with it at the command line. And when I'm happy with it and I've got a good sense of the data, it's only after that he actually jumps into our studio. And I thought that that completely blew like so many perceptions I had because I mean, typically I'll always pull it into our studio. And I didn't, I realized that I had never thought about the command line as a way to actually data wrangle or even data clean or data munge or whatever. And Jared Lander said that that's the first thing he does. He goes straight to the, he says it, it cuts right to the chase. You have no bells or whistles. So I was really blown away by that. And I was like, I need to do this. I just, it just never worked in my hands. I think like the thing I find with stuff like that is that there's, there's two aspects of it. There's like the, the utility of it and there's the comfort with the tool so like you know for instance so like in in our studio like i would as soon as our studio had the view thing i would always be like oh this is great i can just show my data frame i can look at it like a like a data table in excel and go around but the the more i use r the less i use that because i'm used i'm now half and half faster with just in the in the REPL, you know in, in the uh, um the command window just being like, okay, let's grab, you know, do this little filter to grab what I want to look at in this data. Um, and I think Shell is the same way. Shell is incredibly powerful and there's all these tools available and it's, there are a lot that make it really easy to look at data, but there'll be that feeling of discomfort at first where you're like, you know, it, it feels like you're, you know, I don't know, using some power tool that you've never used before. And you're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to cut my hand. So, Brett, have you gotten to the level of comfort where you're actually using the command line actively now for like your initial, just like a quick glance at data? Like it's not just a, an educational thing, you're actually implementing it in your everyday. I actually don't. So like, I'm, that's one of the reasons I want to do this book is because I'm, so I've, I've used Unix in the command line since like the 90s off and on. Um, and one of the things that like my, my, my uh, my computer's been bugging me more and more because it's it's Windows and I don't understand the command line on Windows and um, so I end up doing a lot of that stuff in our studio, um, but like like I'm trying to think of good examples like for, so for instance like um, I'm trying to think of like the last really useful thing that I did in the command line that I could not have done otherwise. So okay, so this is totally random and not data science, but I have a uh, um, a uh, um, a uh, a camera that does time lapse videos and it produces these files that are named like not with the date and like sequentially. So as soon as you reset the memory card, it starts naming them the same names as everything else. So if you want to make a directory that has them all and not overwrite things and have copies of things, you need to rename the files as you're copying them in there. So you can either do that manually and say, okay, I need to rename all the stuff in this directory with the dates and stuff like that, or, you know, you can Google, like I did, you Google how to do a, um, a you know, shell one-liner to do that. So in one line of code, I could copy the files into a directory and at the same time, rename them to have the date and then dash the file name. Um, so that's the kind of stuff that's like really powerful with, with shell. But, Very okay, cool. so, um, so I'm in, I'm in uh, PowerShell right now. Um, <clears throat> I think this is my, my root directory. Uh, so CD is change directory. So that's and when you do CD without any option, without any parameters, it just returns to your home directory. Um, so in order to uh, let's see, I just need to grab the actual book, so I have that to go by. Um, I'm just going to move this to another screen, so you're not going to see the book stuff. Um, so it'll look like I know what I'm talking about. And of course, like all this stuff is much easier if you're a really good typist, which I'm not. Um, okay, yeah. there we go. Um, 
uh, in the second edition. You know, second edition. For me, I find myself using remote machine for running deep learning models. I'm using like a Linux uh, remote machine. So I, I need to, <laughs> I'm always using Tmux, you know, terminal. So I had to like, uh, you know, skill up my skills on, because everything is on terminal. So <laughs> yeah, that's why I like to go through the book. Yeah. Yeah, Tmux is really cool. I've played around with it a little bit, but I haven't had the need to really learn it well. Um, but okay, so uh, um, I've already downloaded that zip file and uncompressed it. It's in the like section two one of the of the chapter. So now I'm going to change to the directory that that's in. Um, so so I saved it in documents. Project just on my system. I just how I organize things. Um, oops. So uh, to do its completion works a lot like it does in R. So I'm just uh, to, to complete a file name, I'm hitting tab. But then instead of giving me a list, it's it's like cycling through the the items that have that that start with those letters. Um, okay, so now I have <clears throat> this directory with data, and it's um, it's been uncompressed. So now I can start my Docker image. Um, so, uh, so first I'm going to start the, the without the data. Um, I'm just going to paste that in because I can type it. There. Um, so this is the this is the command that that just starts the um, <clears throat> that just starts the Docker image. Um, I don't know what the what the flags mean, but you're essentially saying okay, run, and then this is the name of the image to run. You've already that you've already grabbed using the other command. Um, so for feature, if everything's working right, you should just get a dollar sign prompt, and then there's like the you know, the cow say okay. thing. Like yes, yes. Okay. And you see that weird, weird looking image, right? Of whatever that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That cows. Yeah, that's right. The yeah, whatever. Yep, yeah. The cow. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna drop back out of this, and I think you can type exit or something. But the way I do is by hitting Control and D together. And that's an old shell thing that just means like, I can't remember what it, what the actual command is, but it's usually if you're in if you're in a program, you can drop out of it either by hitting Control D, which I think is like end of line, or end of command or something, and then uh, Control C is a harder way to exit something. Like so, if something's not working, you can really hit, hit Control C and exit it. Um, okay, so I'm back to my my okay. PowerShell prompt. Um, but what is the difference between Control D and uh, Control C? Is it Okay, so um, so control. Um, oops, sorry, I'm trying to do two things at once. This is never a good thing for me. So control D is kind of like the way to think about it is a softer control C. Um, like so, um, like when you when you have an application that's not running well and you want to oops when, and you want to quit it. Um, I want to paste this. Um, you can say, okay, please quit. And then if it's really not responding, you can say, okay, make it quit. So yeah. control D is like the please quit and control C is like the make it quit now. Um, mm. and, and because of history, like different programs will interpret those two commands different ways, but in general, that's what the two of them mean. Mm. And eventually I'm gonna figure out how to co copy this line out of the book and paste it into my PowerShell. Okay, so this is the same command we just ran, except that it has this stuff added to it. And I didn't really get this at first, but uh, Sham and I figured it out this morning. Um, so, and actually this is not gonna work in my shell. It's gonna work on Windows, uh, on uh, Mac and on Linux. So this thing here essentially is just saying, run the PWD command, um, which will print the working directory and then insert that before this colon and data. And we figured out this morning that there was, what this is saying in, in Docker speak is mount this directory on the host computer onto this directory in the Docker image. Um, and I'm actually gonna back here and edit it so it'll actually work on my system. Um, okay, so um, in PowerShell that's... Uh, but here, where are we? Are we inside the folder ds or we are inside docker here now okay let me i'll just go back um 
So we can do the PWD command. Uh, oh, okay, actually, okay. Okay. I'm curious if this will, what this will do. Okay. Oh, okay. We are not inside the Docker. Yeah. So we're in, still in the host environment. And PWD mm -hmm. is just a command that lists that, lists yeah. that working okay. directory. Okay. So what this is going to do is it's going to paste that path into the Docker command that we're, that we're typing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, back. Okay. So I got my command back. I still need to edit it to make it work with Windows. Um, and, and so the reason that we're, we're changing it, it's just the syntax of whatever shell you're in. So in PowerShell, the way to get the, get the working directory and paste it in somewhere is to do this. And this is just from the, this is directly from the, from the book. Um, so if I run this, it should start the container uh, with the directory mounted on slash data, which is the, so in, um, in Linux and Mac, um, slash is the beginning of the file system. So instead of saying like C colon for Windows, this is like the equivalent of saying C colon. Um, and okay, so now we're in our Docker container, and now if we say so I'm going to PWD. So PWD is also a command in in Linux shells or in Unix shells. So that should just say where we are. But now we know that we mounted that that data directory on slash data. So I can say cd which is change directory slash data. And if I list, I have that data directory, and if I cd data, I have all the data from the job. Oops. And you know, just like any any environment, and you know, just like the the the, uh, the R REPL, it'll give you errors. Um, so usually, I I feel like shell errors are pretty well pretty pretty easy to interpret. But you know, it's like any any coding environment. You know, new errors will be it'll take a while to to interpret them. Okay, so now I'm inside the chapter two directory, and there's that. Um, that uh, file. So actually, is this going okay so far? Oh, that's right. Richard, you're going to look at this later while you're not driving. So that's good. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, right. So when you are running Docker, nothing now affect your local machine your terminal you are doing everything inside another machine yes yeah that's the best way to think about it it's a, it's a whole different machine that's mostly disconnected um but like for instance i'm in this chat in this uh, data directory um go back up so i'm inside that slash data that we mounted which is you know mounted from our our parent our host computer but if i make a file here um I can demonstrate something from the chapter. So how maybe in the next session, maybe you can give us like now taking like maybe a simple analysis to do plot and now we can dockerize it, put like um, put it as a docker and push it. And <laughs> do you know how to do that? Like how you can package everything as a docker for image and now push it to the docker hub and now some ask your colleague to download it and run it. Do you know how to do that? Uh, that's the part that I haven't done yet. Okay. Um, I think there's there's some of that in the so uh, in the in the thread where you asked about resources for R. I think some of those have that full workup of like saying, okay, let's start from a a base R image. So usually you'll start from a base image. So like that's that rocker thing. Um, rocker is a um, is a group that has made images in Docker for R. So one will just be base R. One will be tidyverse. One will be um, like a shiny image. Um, so you'll start your Docker file by saying, okay, let's start from this image as, as the parent. And then you'll say, okay, well, I need to add these things, like these libraries to my image. I need to add, you know, this data and these pieces of code. And once you've done that, then you tell Docker to say, to run that Docker file and make an image. And it'll go through and basically like, you know, start up that parent image and install all of that stuff onto it. And then it'll write a new image that's like the the one with all your stuff in it. Oh, next week I will I will do a little demo on this. I will go and learn it before next week. <laughs> oh my gosh, I can't type an exclamation point on my keyboard for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> it's crazy. 
Okay, so just like an R, there's a continuation prompt. So I opened a quote, but didn't close it. So it's saying, okay, I don't, that's not a complete command. So I'll close my quote. Uh, um, so I've got that, but let me, what I wanted to do here is show you redirection. Um, Brett, can I ask a question? So this particular right. Docker image that uh, Jaron is using, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his name right, but it's, it comes prepackaged with the R um, interpreter, correct? So it's, it's just got that. So in other words, um, we are not presupposing any loading of uh, libraries outside of what you need just to run the, you know, just to run, is he, is he using like base R or is it, I, I guess it's not tidy words for sure, I think. Uh, well, that's a question we can, we can find out. Let me, let me finish this command and then I'll, I'll, I'll check that because it's, I'm curious about that too. So um, in shell, there's, there's a really important concept, uh, concept called redirection. And everybody who uses R is already familiar with it because of the tidyverse and and uh, um, and McGritter with the um, with the pipe. So in shell, there's a straight pipe, which is that's the reason it's called a pipe because it's the vertical slash which looks like a pipe. Um, and so I can send this to another command like uh, um, this won't make any sense, but this is WC is the word count command. Um, so what this is saying is exactly like in R, it's saying take the output of Kause and put it into um, WC as the first argument. Um, so this is telling me I have uh, eight lines, uh, 19 words, and 205 characters in what I just piped into it. Um, and then um, another way to pipe is with, um, with the uh, greater than, less than. And these allow you to send things to a file. So um, this greater than means send the output of this command to the file name that follows this. I'm gonna say, um, call it cow.txt. So I did that, it's not gonna give any output because it's sending the output to the, to the, to the file. But now I just wanted to check something that I think, I think Sham was asking about. Uh, so I'm gonna drop out of the container, right in control D, and then now I'm, I'm in this, I'm in my, my window shell and I'm in that directory that we had mounted. So now there should be a file in here called cow.txt. So I'm able to talk both ways between the two systems. So if I, uh, um, I still have less on the system, I don't know. Eh, no, see, this is this is why I hate PowerShell because it has this like nine line error for something that is it has a missing file. Cat. It has cat maybe, C-A-T. Probably. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so that's the file that I sent over to the Windows container. So I'm gonna um, tab up or up arrow to get back to the Docker container, start it up again. And then for you, you were asking about R. So I'm gonna try just running R. Yeah. So now I'm I'm in the, you know, so it's R version, it's an old version, so it doesn't doesn't have the uh, the pipe, the new pipe. Uh, um, yeah. so this is just the R prompt. I mean if um, if you run R from a shell, this is what you'll get. And this is this is the same thing that, that R Studio does to produce the um, the window on the bottom, the um, the command window. The, con the console window. Um, the console, yeah. right. Um, so if I say the question. And yay, we have tidyverse, but we don't have a font that can display things correctly. Nice. <laughs> yay. Awesome. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so cool. um, I think this is a really awesome thing. This Docker is really beautiful. Oh my God, yeah. So, Brett, can I ask you a question? So, let's say that, um, so I work mostly in AWS at work, and one of the issues is that, um, you know, the tidy models um, ecosystem is not exactly integrated because SageMaker on AWS is more like a Python based thing. So, you can do reticulate, and of course, who wants to mess with that? I mean, I know I don't. So is this an option where you can containerize your entire tidy models thing, and then you can, um, now many, many, to, many utilities on AWS come with like, like an R, like you, you can launch like an R interpreter, like if you create an endpoint or something, but you can actually dockerize your entire tidy uh, models ecosystem. And then you can just run straight R commands and it will still run within that Docker, which has the capacity to handle everything that tidy <clears throat> that the tidy models ecosystem comes with, even though your environment on AWS can't. So you can create custom Docker images, correct? With this? 
Yeah, so you could create a custom image and the, the, I'm not really familiar with AWS. So the, the only thing that I'm not sure about there is whether you can run, where, whether you can launch that Docker image in a place that'll be helpful to you on AWS. And you probably can, because I know that Amazon uses Docker heavily. Um, yes. Yes. So just it would just be a matter of figuring that out. And then, I mean, that would actually be great because then you can, you know, presumably launch your image that's co-located with your data so that you can then be really fast with the data that's in your AWS. Yeah. So you get the processing juice from AWS, but you, you're not limited by, you know, with, to just using what SageMaker offers, which is predominantly Python packages at this point. And, and the other thing that, that, uh, um, Docker is really good for, and that systems administrators really like is that you're not like, you're not polluting their system by, by saying, oh, I want to install R and all these packages. It's right. just a self-contained image and, and they can control what your image can see in the environment so they can keep it safe and keep it, you know, so it's, I think it's so, also popular for that reason. It, so if I use um, uh, jargon from AWS, it's kind of like a virtual environment, a self-contained virtual environment that you're launching and you're essentially running it in its own space, correct? So it can come pre-packaged with whatever libraries that you've already compiled. I'm guessing you don't even need to load the libraries or I don't know how, how that would work. You probably would load it, I guess. Uh, so it's um, so you'd still need the, you know, the library command within your, within your I see. script, okay. but you don't need to so once so once those libraries are installed in your environment and in your Docker image, you won't need to yeah. you know install packages for those. It's excellent, excellent for me because I really need to integrate tidy models into my workflow. But we work only in AWS, and it's it's not easy to do it there. So I'm I'm really what I really want to do at the end of this is to see if I can create a custom Docker image. I know it's a it's a long shot, but I'd like to. Yeah. So. Um, um... Brett, can I see that thing where you use the um, pipe? Yeah. So the where you you use the uh, you send something. To, oh, where are we now? Oh, okay. Can oh, you so we're, in it? Yeah. Can so we go? Th this is the biggest problem with uh, with command line interfaces is that the context switching is really hard. So like, you know, I'm I'm in a PowerShell window. And then I'm in a Docker container, and then I'm inside R inside the Docker container. So it's like that context, which is really that's hard for me at least. So uh, okay, so go out from say, say your question again. Yeah, when when you send something using um, greater than, it mm -hmm. send it send the results to the local machine, not inside Docker. So uh, the greater than doesn't care doesn't care about any of that. Um, so I'm going to drop, I'm dropping out of R. So now I'm just in the shell again. Um, so I'm going to CD to my, my home directory now. I guess I'm already in my home directory. Okay, so there's nothing in there, right? So I'm going to do this uh, cow say again. Oh, I can't because it's in the old container. That's one problem is that the container has no memory of anything you've done in a previous oh. instance of it. Um, what do you mean? You mean the data you copied is not there now? So, okay. So the, the data that I wrote to a file that's on my host system is there. So like if I ls uh, data, so cow is there in data. But one, what I'm gonna do now is, uh, um, again, I'm in, my, I'm in my, my root directory. So this is not a directory that's shared between the two, between the host machine and the Docker instance. So I'm gonna do this, the same thing. Um, yeah, so. My question is, this file, cow.pst, it's, I saw it on your machine, not inside Docker, is that correct? Uh, yes. But so the... I have two things, one inside Docker here, we can see it, and the other one in your local machine, is that correct? Yeah, so I can see it in both places, so like, um, so I just, we just looked at it in, in the Docker container and I'm just going to grab a, that's it over there. Um, so I'm just browsing to the, that, that directory that's shared between the two, between the my host machine and the Docker instance. So this is actually like, you know, in windows and there's, there's cow.txt. Um, and, but the, the thing I was going to do 
now is uh, to talk about that redirect again. Um, so the greater than to redirect the output to a file, if I say, um, so I'm gonna redirect the cow.txt again. So that, that redirect, this doesn't, this doesn't care at all where the files are. Um, all it's saying is it's, it's telling the shell, and this is a shell command. All it's, it's telling the shell, take the output of this and write it to this file that I say. And the shell is totally responsible for where that file goes, you know, where it exists. Yeah. Um, so because we're in the, in the root, because we're in the home directory of that Docker image. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I've done that, it's there. So now I can do ls, there's cow.txt. Uh, um, I love this, that command. I'm gonna learn like so many new commands from this book. Um, so there's the cow stuck in our container. But now if I drop out of the container, so now I'm back in my Windows shell, um, that file doesn't exist here because the, the, the directory structure from my container doesn't exist on my host's machine. Um, so that was the kind of... What is this bat, B-A-T? Oh, uh, that was in the book. It's a, it's a um, well, we can enter the container again and we can find out. Um, see if there's a manual page for it. So man is just like question mark in in, uh, in R. Yes, yeah, so is a manual page. Um, Unix manual pages tend, tend to be really verbose, but it's just like R. They follow a set a set structure, so it's kind of easy to find what you want. Well, I wouldn't say easy, but some commands are like ridiculously long. Anyway, so it's a it's a cat clone with syntax highlighting and Git integration. So cat is a is a really simple shell command that all it does is it takes what its input is and prints it to the screen it's like print in r um, ah. except without any methods to make anything look nice okay. um, and this bat command which is totally new to me as of today is a um, is a variation on that that will get yeah it'll so it'll so it'll pick the um so I'm gonna put out of the man page um, i'm gonna go to my data directory now Sorry for the aside. Um, okay, so now I'm in the chapter two data. So now I can say, so this is the part that, that I'm, I'm sorry, I'm jumping around so much. This, this is the part that wasn't in the chapter. Um, there's this thing like, oh, just, you know, just uh, you know, type that uh, back uh, uh, pi. Um, and actually, I'm going to, before I do that, I'm going to CD, I'm going to CD back to my home directory. And then I'm going to say, just like it says in the, in the text of the chapter, um, that pi. It doesn't exist. So the problem is, is that he doesn't tell you to go to um, data directory that you mounted um, and wherever that you put the data from that you downloaded. So now I'm in that directory. Now factpy is in there, so I can say. Um, so now I can see it, and this is the really nice thing about this bat program is that it does syntax highlighting. It has line numbers. It, it looks really nice. I don't know what the Git integration part of it is, but that's probably also really interesting. So Brett, all of Jaron scripts are in Python. Um, I don't know. I haven't looked through it enough to know. Um, I know he's an R guy too, so. But um, he, do, he do Python, he does Python. Yeah, mm -hmm. I saw his post in LinkedIn yesterday. He's given like um, a seminar on using uh, Python for data. Um, That's true, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for, yeah yesterday. So I'm guessing yeah. if that Python file is filing within the R um, console. I mean, I, obviously you haven't run it yet, but um then the, the 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 docker image already has reticulate and whatever else mounted and and good to go i guess that's how that's working it, it should yeah so i mean so in so in this case it's uh so if, if i want to run this and i think he's yeah like in the in the chapter he tells you how to run this script so now that i now that we know where it is i can say um okay and the the bit of this notation that's, that might be new to you guys is dot slash um, so the way that you, the way that 
that the shell knows how to run a command. So like what 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 happens when I run CD? Like where is it finding that? Um, actually, CD is not a good example because that's built into the shell. But uh, um, but the but the question is like how does it know how to run that command? Uh, where does it find the file to execute to run that? Um, so if I say which yeah, so CD is a built-in command, so that's not a good example, but bat I don't think is. So, okay, so this will tell you what executable it's going to run when you type bat. And the way it knows how to find this directory slash user right. slash bin slash bat um, is by the path. Um, this, this, is another, this is another random aside, so hopefully, this is, this, hopefully these are somewhat useful. Um, see me not look lagging. Very cool, thank you. Um, and this is where my, my knowledge of Z shell is going to break down. Um, but in any case, all shells have a concept of the execution path. So what it'll do when you type a word by itself on the command line, like if I type, uh, um, hi. so we're, so we're in, oops, um, does this work? Hey, it works. So, um, remembering some of my old shortcuts. So minus will go back to the last directory you were in if you give that to a parameter to CD. Um, so if I ls here, okay, we've got this fact.py. So what happens if I say pi? So you might expect it just to run that, that Python script, um, but it doesn't because command's not found. Um, and the reason is that this directory that we're in is not in a path. So it's kind of like a safety thing. It doesn't want to just run random things that you type on the command line if it happens to be in the directory that you're in. Um, so since this directory is not on the execution path, like it's, it looks through all that and doesn't find something named fact.py, we need to specifically tell the shell to execute that. And that's what this dot slash is. It says um, the dot is current directory. So in the current directory, so dot slash run this thing. Um, and the piece of information that may or may not help you remember this is that if you give a complete path to a command, the shell will, will run it. Um, and dot is a way of supplying a complete path because it's a shortcut for saying PWD essentially. Um, so if I run this now, um, it is gonna give an error because that, that Python script does not handle any errors. So you could see this, uh, <clears throat> Um, so this is a so this Python script is defining a function called factorial, and so it says okay for this number return the the factorial of that number. Um, this bit down here is a, is is a Python thing that says if this file is is being executed directly, do this stuff below it. It's kind of a cool Python feature. Um, I don't think R really has an equivalent. Um, but so what this is saying is like okay so get the argument that's given on the command line and use that as X and then write the, write the output of factorial of X to the command line. That's what std out right is. So st if you see um, std in or std out, that's standard input and standard output. Um, you'll see that in the context of redirection. So standard input is, is essentially like what you're, what's being put into a command. So like if I pipe something into something, what I'm piping in is the standard input and the output of a command. Like, so when I type CD and I see a directory listing, that's the standard output of CD. Um, okay. So if I do factpy and then give it a parameter, where'd my cursor go? My cursor's gone. Um, I say, what's the factorial of five? I get 120. So, yeah, I'm, I'm out of I'm out of my long-winded asides. <laughs> Do you guys have any questions? This is awesome. So you don't actually need to start a R like command. You don't need to start an instance of the R whatever. Like you, you could just directly run the script. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah that's that's the beauty of the of the shell is that like, and I think there's a chapter on this in here is that you can basically make any R script that takes an input and gives an output into a shell command. Um, let, me, let me see if I can find an example. Um, I think that's chapter four. Yeah. 
Is there an R? Yes. Okay. So um, okay. So there's this this buzz example in R, um, and part of the trick is this line up here, which we'll learn about later. I'm not going to describe it now. Um, so this is just an implementation of, of FizzBuzz. Um, I don't know what this is because they don't use it actually down below. I think it's just an example of what, what the output it should produce. So this, they define this function um, that takes a number and gives the, gives the, oh, no, it does. Oh, it's, it's doing kind of an advanced FizzBuzz where it's using this to, to produce the output. Uh, I would not have done that that way in, a, in something that's for beginners, but um, I, I, I don't think I could have coded it that way. Anyway, um, okay, so let's just, let's just assume that the function does what it says it does. It's going to take a number and give the fizzbuzz result. And then this part is what makes it work with the shell. So it's saying, okay, um, from, and I don't, I've never used the file command, file function in R before. So I'm assuming what it's doing is it's saying, okay, take standard input and put it into F, open that, open that object F or open that file F. And then it's going to read um, what's coming in on F um, until it's until it stops. Run the fizzbuzz command with the that end that it's reading from this file, which is the standard input. Um, and then write the result of that to standard output. So, and this is I mean, this is the first time I'm seeing this too. I don't, it's we'll we'll see more of it in chapter four, I think. Um, but okay, so we have this command. So I can say, well, how do I run a command? I do um, do dot slash and then fizzbuzz and then run R. So I think if I run it without anything, it's going to fail. Oh, nope, even worse, it's going to give us a blinking cursor. Um, and I think that's because of how this is written. Um, so it's using this while loop. So it's saying, okay, while something is coming in on, on uh, standard input, um, it's essentially just waiting for me to put something in. So if I do fizzbuzz of three, it'll be a fizz. Fizzbuzz of five, it'll be buzz. Um, and it'll keep, keep on doing this forever. Oh, it actually doesn't know how to do fizzbuzzes that were, or maybe it doesn't know how to do them. Uh, 20, I think 20 is in a fizzbuzz. Yeah, okay, so it knows how to do that. Um, so then I'm kind of stuck in this. So how, this, this comes back to like, how do you get out of something? Um, you could try control D first. It'll bring us back to the, back to the command line. I'm gonna run it again. So we're in that, that command again. Uh, we're in that, running that R, R function again. <clears throat> and then if I say C, yeah. Oh, I guess C does work there, but it's a little different. Anyway, those are the two ways to get out of something. And so what this is doing is it's saying, um, when I when I run this, when I run that uh, dot fizzbuzz.r, it's saying, okay, um, is there something in the path? And because because dot gives it a complete path, it's saying, ah, okay, there's a file that's named that. Load that file. Um, it loads that file, and this is a special shell line. Um, when it sees this, it says, ah, okay, I know we need to execute this like this. So what it's doing is is running this R script command in order to execute the R. And R script will start up, R script starts in our interpreter and then it goes through all your code and executes it. And then it will take stuff from the shell and return it to the shell. Very, very cool. Thank you so much. Yeah, and that was a lot packed into a little bit and I'm kind of learning this as I go along. So hopefully I got that part right. Um, so Brett, um, running R script as well. Um, we need to use this kind of stuff like a hash. I mean, you really took away all of my pain points. So, so grateful. And I will definitely present uh, next week, uh, Shamsuddin, because I think I'm clear now what mistake I was making. Okay, cool. cool. Thank you, Brett. You are awesome. Yeah, no problem. This is kind of fun stuff. And I like, I, I'm really happy to, I mean, I've learned a lot by going through this chapter. So I'm glad that I, you know, this is actually super helpful for me too. So guys, I'm going to jump off, but again, thank you so much. And uh, I'll do the next week. So thanks again, guys. 
Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think I gotta I gotta jump off too. But um, okay. yeah, this is this is fun. I'm hopefully gonna be have time to do this for you. Yeah, thank you. Great. Okay. See ya. Bye.